I'm Daniel Johnson. I'm the editor of Standpoint magazine, and I want to welcome you all very, very warmly for coming here on a Sunday afternoon uh, to hear about the Bible. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's an unusual thing to happen in the Natural History Museum, but, uh, but so much the better for that. And uh, I want, uh, first of all, I'm just going to tell you what we're going to be doing. Um, our discussion will last until about quarter to five, uh, and then we're going to throw it open to all of you uh, to ask whatever questions you have, either for Yoram or for the Chief Rabbi, and uh, I very much hope that we will have a very lively discussion. That will last for about half an hour, uh, and then there will be book signing uh, for those of you, and I hope it will be many of you, uh, who are inspired uh, to take home a copy of, um, uh, of this, this wonderful book, uh, The Philosophy of Hebrew Scripture. Uh, so now, first of all, I want to welcome up onto the stage Yoram Hazoni. Uh, Yoram, please uh, come and join us. Um, and uh, Yoram, great, great to see you. Um, please take a seat. Uh, Yoram, uh, many of you will already know his work. Um, uh, he first came to my attention uh, about a dozen years ago with this very controversial book, The Jewish State, The Struggle for Israel's Soul, uh, a more political and historical work than the one we're talking about today. Um, and uh, he is, of course, the founder, uh, and now I think provost, uh, is that right, of the Shalem Center uh, in Jerusalem, uh, which uh, has done amazing work, I think, in bringing together uh, intellectuals from all over the world uh, to uh, discuss a very wide range of things, but particularly, of course, Jewish thought. Um, so uh, Yoram's uh, uh, on, a, on a worldwide tour uh, discussing the philosophy of Hebrew scripture, and we're very, very fortunate to have him here today. Um, uh, our other guest, I think, probably needs no introduction uh, here. Um, Jonathan Sachs, Lord Sachs, the chief rabbi uh, of Great Britain and the Commonwealth, uh, is, of course, himself uh, a distinguished philosopher, uh, you know, in an academic sense, uh, and, uh, and, of course, also uh, a magnificent spokesman, uh, not only for uh, Judaism and the Jewish people, uh, but actually for religion in general. Uh, we were just discussing a moment ago uh, his recent debates with Richard Dawkins, and he's, uh, he's been prepared uh, like... Uh, like my namesake, uh, the prophet Daniel, to go into the lion's den many a time uh, to defend uh, the, the Bible and uh, the, the biblical uh, tradition, if you like. Um, uh, so, again, without further ado, uh, Jonathan Sachs. Please, come and, come and sit down. Now, um, I wanted to uh, uh, begin... Uh, with the Bible. The, he the Hebrew Bible may be read in many ways, uh, as history, as law, as poetry, as prophecy. But Yoram, you are proposing to read it as philosophy. Now, what can this approach bring to the Bible, a book that has already undergone more exhaustive exegesis and analysis than pr probably all other sacred texts put together? Uh, Give us, give us uh, basically, you know, why have you written this book? Well, look, I don't, I don't think that the word philosophy is itself the most important thing. The most important thing is, do we read the Bible for ideas or do we not read it for ideas? Right? So calling it philosophy, calling it wisdom is, uh, is a, a way of focusing on this question. And in fact, there's a very, very old tradition in, uh, in the West which says, no, actually, the, the Bible is a unique kind of text. It's a, it's, a, it's a revelation. And as revelation, it consists in a bypassing of man's natural faculties, natural capacity to explore the world and try to understand the truths that, about the nature of reality, about the way we should live. 
and instead to, to suspend all of these, these faculties that we have and to, to accept things that are not necessarily reasonable, maybe even completely absurd. And so many, many people think, both in the public and, and academics who study it, they th they've come to think of the Bible as, as this absurd document that doesn't contain ideas. It's not like Plato or Hobbes, something that we could just study it and, and, and learn from its wisdom. And here I, I propose that we can. We can learn from its wisdom just like Plato and Hobbes. <coughs> Jonathan, you have acclaimed the philosophy of Hebrew scripture as, uh, I quote, a paradigm-shifting work of immense significance. But as a philosopher and as a rabbi, you spent much of your life bringing the entire intellectual arsenal of Western thought to bear on the Hebrew Bible, as indeed have countless other rabbis before you. So what is Yoram doing that's new? What is, it, what is he doing that hasn't been done at least since the time of Maimonides? Mm. It's a good question, Daniel. The truth is, Uram is reclaiming the Bible as one of the constitutive texts of Western civilization. Um, and that is certainly something Maimonides was doing. Maimonides was reading the Bible as a philosopher, and he was reading it as philosophy. He was doing so in a slightly different way. I mean, he used to see the philosophy of the Bible as very much beneath the surface, and the narratives of the Bible were essentially allegories. Uh, and um, Yoram is telling us to see the narratives of the Bible as themselves exemplifying major philosophical, moral, political views. Um, and I think that's the way to go in the 21st century. What I like about Yoram's work is he's come as a Bible scholar um, to some of the work that I've been doing in, in, from the opposite direction. So I tried to show, for instance, in the politics of hope that you could build a political philosophy around the Bible or dignity of difference, a global ethic, or a theory of national identity in the home we build together. So I've kind of done this as a philosopher rather than as a Bible scholar, and Yoram has done it as a Bible scholar coming out from there. Uh, but I do think we do need to reclaim the Bible as a book of ideas. I once said Nietzsche was right in framing the choice before humanity. Do we follow the idea of power or do we follow the power of ideas? And Judaism has always been about the power of ideas. Uh, I think they called uh, one of the posthumously published uh, works of Isaiah Berlin the power of ideas. And that's something that drives us as a, as a people and as a faith. Mm. Your, um, the main villain of your book uh, is Tertullian, uh, a Latin church father of the second and third centuries who lived in Roman Carthage. Um, and actually one of your chapters is actually called Carthage and Jerusalem. Um, now you hold his radical contrast between faith and reason responsible for the failure to read Hebrew scripture in the same way that we read Plato and Aristotle, for example. Whereas Tertullian asked, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? Uh, quid ergo Athenis et hierosolimnis? Hiero sol um, you argue that the real contrast is between his Carthaginian form of Christianity and the Jerusalem of the Bible, which has much more in common with the Athens of Plato. You describe Tertullian as a fanatic, omitting to mention that he did live at a time when the Romans were persecuting the Christians, so he had some excuse for being a bit fanatical. However, he demands that Christians believe in the death of Christ because it is absurd, and in the resurrection because it is impossible. You quote modern Christian apologists, such as Kierkegaard and C.S. Lewis, echoing his line of argument. Now, all this may or may not be fair to Tertullian, He's a fairly obscure figure now who eventually even left the church because it, it wasn't rigorous, rigorous enough for him. But are you being fair to the Christian mainstream? Uh, isn't the great achievement of Christianity its reconciliation of Hellenic and Hebraic thought, in other words, of Athens and Jerusalem? Not only is the New Testament written in Greek, the early Christians even read Hebrew scripture in Greek too, in the form of the Pentateuch. So to put it another way, what has Tertullian's Carthage 
to do with the Rome of Aquinas or, say, Benedict the Sixteenth? Look, I, I, I think that Tertullian is, uh, uh, is not the, he's not really the interesting figure. As at, at, I mean, your, your question directs us to what is interesting, which is the question of what is Christianity in its mainstream versions? What is its relationship with, uh, with Hebrew scripture? And the achievement of Christianity to begin with, even before we start speaking about it as a synthesis, its first achievement is to take Hebrew Bible and to bring it to humanity. Now, Christians today are of many, many different kinds. And uh, among those, there, there, there are those who, uh, uh, like, like Tertullian still, uh, see uh, Christianity as being absolutely essentially uh, a, a faith and maybe even a faith in things that are uh, impossible and improbable and therefore we believe. But most Christians that, that, that I know, and I, I'm, I'm speaking now uh, about Christian philosophers, Christian theologians, as well as simply Christian men and women, most of the Christians that I know, there is invested at least, as we are, as Jews are, in actually understanding what the Hebrew Bible is about rather than in trying to you know, say, well, I, I've inherited some particular doctrine and I have to read it into these scriptures. And the, the position of a Christian in, in the modern world, no, if he or she is no longer willing to accept uh, that the, the whole Old Testament is, is, is uh, a, a, a foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus, but rather wants to learn it, as many Christians have historically, as a scripture that has its own meaning and its own message, which is directed to Christians and to humanity and not simply to the Jews. Well, such a Christian, and there are many, doesn't necessarily have the tools to be able to do that. And one of the, the, the things that I hope to do with this book is to, is to distinguish, is to say, well, look, it, 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 if C.S. Lewis appeals to you, then that's legitimate. But if you actually want to know what, what the Old Testament is about, well, the Old Testament is, you're going to have to read it as a work that appeals to the reason of, of, of the audience, including you. That means it, it deals with, with great questions of political theory and, uh, uh, and metaphysics and ethics. Many Christians want to see it in this way, and this book, I hope, will help. Yeah. Um, Chief, Chief Rabbi, uh, in order to demonstrate the philosophical character of the Bible, isn't your um, at risk of widening the division between Judaism and Christianity? Do you think his way of looking at it uh, is, is a wise undertaking? Does it respect what you call the dignity of difference? Uh, or is this just a good way of getting people to start having a robust debate about it? Uh, well, I hope not, because I hope there are not too many disciples of Tertullian around today, at least in this room. Um, I've yet to meet one, actually. And I believe in Tertullian because he's impossible. Um, and I love Tertullian. I, 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 if I can say this, uh, telling a personal story, you know, I had this, I tell this story in my book, The Great Partnership. I had as my tutor, my doctoral supervisor in Cambridge, one of the world's great atheists, you know, when we had really great atheists, and uh, uh, the late Sir Bernard Williams. And Sir Bernard Williams was very rarely spoke about the reasons that made him give up his Catholicism. But he did, his first published essay was called Tertullian's Paradox, uh, in which uh, he argues that credo quia impossibili est is a ridiculous, well, it's an impossible creed, he said, because if you believe in nonsense, what is your criterion for distinguishing holy nonsense from nonsense nonsense? <laughs> Which is a very good point. And it made me warm to him. You know, I was a very religious guy. I hope I still am. And here was this major atheist and, and superb intellect. And here I was reading him absolutely shred to tell you. And I thought to myself, this is an atheist I can really relate to because Maimonides doesn't attack Tertullian, but he attacks those people in Judaism who thought like him, that there are certain laws in Judaism that called chukim, called statutes, 
that are beyond reason. And Maimonides, in the same way as Bernard Williams, says if it's beyond reason, what makes you think that's above humanity? Maybe it's below humanity. So I thought if my atheist supervisor can say the same sort of things as Moses Maimonides, then this is an atheist from whom I can learn. And of course, what is common here is our commitment to reason and public discourse. And that is why I think, you know, the, the, the Catholic tradition that you represent, and let us acknowledge the 50th anniversary of that process that set in motion Nostra Aetate and, and Pope John XXIII, that has been one of the great acts of reconciliation in all of human history. It transformed the relationship between Jews and Catholics from one of estrangement to one of friendship, and it continues to be so. And I regard this coming together of Jews and Christians um, as, as, as a real signal of transcendence. It's a sign of hope that a relationship of estrangement that lasted for the better part of 2,000 years can be healed. And it can be healed because uh, Catholic theologians and Jewish theologians have shared that belief in, in reason. Reason and revelation are not two uh, exclusive categories. God talks to us as, um, as, as, as beings in, in the image of God, that is, beings who share a rationality with God. And you see that most obviously the way the Bible deals with the concept of justice. God can uh, bring a case against Israel for failing to keep their side of the bargain, but Abraham and Moses and Jeremiah and Job can have an argument with God. They can speak the same language because justice, which is reason applied to the moral life, um, is the language of faith. So, you know, Tertullian is tremendously useful in all of this because if you're going to pick an opponent, try and pick one who's dead. <laughs> try and pick one who's been dead a very long time and try and pick one who doesn't have too many disciples today. Um, for those who come to the Hebrew Scriptures from a secular background, Yoram, you make a very strong claim that the general nature of the arguments used in the Bible is relevant to everybody, not just to religious people, because understanding the Bible requires no prior commitment to the God of Israel. Uh, and I quote you, while they, the, the scriptures, were written for the instruction of the Jews, there is no reason why the standpoint and argument they make should not be heard and debated among all nations. End quote. Why should secularists, whether Jews or Gentiles, atheists or agnostics, bother to study the holy book of a nation so remote in time and place? What, what, what does it bring for the secular mind? Well, I, th I, I think that there's, there's a, <laughs> a, a crucial question, which is, which is in fact what's being debated in, 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 in public, you know, in the chief rabbi debating uh, Dawkins uh, most recently, is, is precisely a debate over, over one thing, which is whether the Bible is something that as, as uh, uh, many of the current atheist uh, uh, polemicists have said repeatedly, and, and many academics who follow them, uh, is the Bible in fact a book of darkness, of barbarism, and something that in terms of its teachings we'd best set it aside, because to the extent that you don't set it aside, you're endangering all of humanity. That's a very, very well defended and articulated position today in, in our society. And the, the question is, those of us who see the Bible as actually offering something, is there any way that we can say that what that something is without appealing to things that our, that our colleagues, that our interlocutors simply don't believe? I mean, it, it's, it's just not that helpful to, to begin a conversation by saying, well, I believe in God and I believe that, the, the, that uh, the, this scripture was written by God and that it's binding on me. Th that leaves out the people that I'm speaking to and gives them no hope of being able to identify with what it is that I'm saying. So without, without taking away in, in any sense from that way of describing, uh, describing what's in scripture, 
I think that the Bible also has many, many other things, and they can be translated into a language that anyone can understand. And not only that, but I think they were written in such a way that it should, they should be acceptable. Moses begins his, his, his great speech in Deuteronomy by telling uh, the children of Israel that, that, this, that this teaching, that he's teaching them, should be their, their, uh, their wisdom and their understanding in the sight of the nations. And there are many, many other such passages in the Bible. That is, the assumption of the prophets is that the nations should be able to simply look at this and discuss it with us and see the wisdom in it. Now, if that's not happening today, and uh, with, with, with the exception of the extraordinary uh, 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 mission and a a activism of the chief rabbi, there are very, very few additional people that you can point to who are in fact making this translation and bringing the, the Jewish teaching to the world. With, with very few exceptions, this is simply not something that's happening. Now, we have to ask ourselves, why is this not happening? And I think that the answer begins with the fact that we don't necessarily as Jews look at the Bible as speaking in the language of reason. I mean, of course, we, we, you know, when we discuss it on, on Sabbaths or in yeshivas and seminaries, we, 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 we do talk about it as reason, but we don't know how to explain that to, to others. And I, I, I'm, I'm hoping that, 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 that this will help, that this book will help as, uh, as an opening. What it does is it, it begins from the premise that the reader does not believe in God, that the reader does not accept any kind of divine involvement in the writing of the text, and asks, nevertheless, is it true that what you see is a, is a barbaric book? And I find the opposite. I find that it's a book that, in fact, brings hope for the first time, political hope and, uh, and, and a certain moral perspective that later becomes associated with, with things that many people believe in, into the world for the first time. To lose that, the original source of uh, an outside perspective, a perspective beyond the corruption of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, corrupt men and, and societies, which is, which is what the Bible proposes for the first time in human history, to simply lose that and give up on it because Professor Dawkins or others believe that they can create morality from the ground up. Well, I have yet to see that done. And I, I, I think that, yes, a, a person who doesn't necessarily believe should be able to approach the Bible and see it, then I, I, I think that we can all help in this. Chief Rabbi, what, what, what does the Bible, uh, building on that, have to teach the, a world which regards all books, sacred and profane, as to some extent obsolete, which has a sort of contempt for the literary culture that Jews have always had, and, and, and many Christians too in the past. In other words, um, in a deeply secularized world, um, are, we, are we ready to have this argument? Are we ready, are Jews in particular ready, to have a robust debate, uh, not only with Christians, but with militant atheists? Oh, absolutely, and I, I, I road test this quite a number of times each year because of that wonderfully eccentric English institution called Thought for the Day, <laughs> which is another illumination of Tertullian's paradox. I mean, you couldn't, I, it exists only because it's impossible. There you are, getting up in the morning, ready to face a new day, and some rabbi gives you a sermon just when you are looking forward to life, you know. So it's a wonderfully eccentric thing. And uh, it, it forced me from day one to grapple with this question, how can I speak from the heart of faith to an audience, 99.5% of which do not share that faith, because we're only half a percent of the population of Britain. And it's absolutely amazing how easy it is. I've never found somebody saying, I couldn't understand you. Lots of people saying, I don't agree with you, but nobody ever said, I don't understand you, and what right have you got? Uh, to speak to me. Nobody ever said that. So if you take that uh, message, a biblical message to the world, it is astonishing how many people, be they Christian or Sikh or Muslim or Hindu or plain secular, relate to it. Um, what is distinctive about that message coming from the Hebrew Bible? Um, Yaram has mentioned one concept which I think is fundamental, the idea of hope. You know, that, what I admired Bernard Williams for was his 
ability unflinchingly to look at a world without hope. You know, I, I call that the tragic uh, image picture of life. Greece gave us the heroism of tragedy. And Judaism gave us the alternative of hope, the principled rejection of tragedy in the name of hope, which is fundamental to Isaiah, and it's fundamental, really, to the whole biblical message. I think there are two other things that are fundamental. Number one is freedom, individual and personal freedom, which is the basis of our belief in a free society. If there can be a complete, exhaustive, scientific description of human behavior, that means that all, scientific, all human behavior is a matter of uh, inescapable effect of inevitable causes. There is no human freedom. Now, if there is no human freedom, then why even bother to have a free society? I said this to um, Richard Dawkins' friend and colleague, uh, the neuroscientist Colin Blakemore. Uh, unfortunately, that bit of the program was not fully broadcast. I did it a couple of years ago. I say, Colin, if you're right, Colin is a hard determinist. He believes human beings are not free at all. I said, in that case, why on earth do we have courts of justice that punish criminals? Just do some neuroscience, you know, just wheel them into the operating room, remove that bit of the prefrontal cortex or the amygdala that's giving them an extra bit of aggression. Why not just treat them? Why punish them? And he could not answer it. He said, well, I can see why totalitarian regimes might choose to do that. Actually, even non-totalitarian, even American, America in the 50s was doing lobotomies or leucotomies to do just that. And I think A Clockwork Orange is, is about that theme. So I think there is something that, that the Hebrew Bible talks about. It's the theme of Adam and Eve, Cain and Abel. The whole story is about how God gave human, human beings freedom and how they misused it, but how God never yet gave up faith in humans. So freedom. Number two, human dignity. If we are just a bundle of chemicals, a bundle of selfish genes, then in what sense do we ascribe any special dignity to the human person? And you know that, uh, you know, I, 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 I was incredible. Did any of you see this wonderful documentary about the work of Dr. Ludwig Gutmann, who was the inspiration behind the Paralympics, you know? And Ludwig Gutmann comes along as a as Jew from an Orthodox fa family background, comes here as a refugee from Germany, sees the way paraplegics are being treated. They have a life behind them, but nothing in front of them. And he comes in and says, no, these are human beings. Choose life. You could feel that mosaic imperative, therefore choose life. Um, and he gives them back life. So this belief in human dignity is not some abstract idea. It's changed the way we've regarded paraplegics. And in Jerusalem right now, there's a 92-year-old professor called Reuven Feuerstein who's done the same for deeply traumatized and brain-damaged <coughs> children. So here is a sense of human dignity that's given back paraplegics and brain-damaged children their hope for the future. So freedom, dignity, and hope are not concepts that conflict with science, but they are forever beyond the remit of science, which is why B.F. Skinner called his book Beyond Freedom and Dignity. I do not want to go down the road beyond freedom and dignity. And if we want to preserve those, then we are going to have to begin and enlist highly secular people with a strong humanistic sense and actually go, go into conversation with them and say, these are things worth fighting for. Your, um, your argument requires a rethinking of the way that we uh, read the, the, the Hebrew Bible's depiction of God. It's a shift. I'm not saying you, you advocate this shift uh, for, for everyone, but, but for those re the kind of readers uh, Jonathan was just talking about, it's a shift from God the King of Israel uh, to God the Father of Humanity. But does this do justice to what the Scripture actually says? 
when God speaks to the patriarchs and prophets, he does so as Lord. That is, he demands that we should obey his law, keep his covenant, and heed his prophecies. God does not philosophize, he commands. Now, you say that in order to understand how the patriarchs and prophets experience God speaking to them, we need to abandon classical or medieval concepts of reason and revelation. God, you argue, poses questions rather than delivering lectures, allowing the human interlocutor to find the answers himself. So when a prophet hears God calling, you claim, this has nothing to do with the Greek notion of inspiration, of being filled with a spirit from outside, nor is it the later idea of an inner voice. It is, you say, something else. But what? Well, there's a, gr a great many important questions there, and I, I, I fear that I can't ad address all of them, and it would take the rest of the afternoon. Uh, so let me, let me just uh, uh, begin at a certain point and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and try, try to, um, to answer. Uh, Hebrew Bible has um, a number of different metaphors uh, which it uses to help human beings understand what it means to have a, a, a world that, that has a God in it. So the most commonly uh, discussed one, the one that's sort of constantly uh, within the public eye and in, 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 in these debates about you know, sh should we believe in God or not and is it damaging, is, is the image of God as king uh, sitting on his throne, distant, cold, giving out orders, making decisions. Right? Now there's no doubt that that view is in the Bible. I don't have any intention of denying it and it's important. But it's also the case that that's not the only image and the, the prophets in sort of mercilessly mixing the different metaphors, uh, they teach us a way to approach reality which is not monolithic and does not simply accept that kind of um, uh, distant cold God giving out orders as the only form of religious understanding. At least as important uh, is uh, what, what we call the God of the covenant. Right? And the covenant is not identical. The brit, the idea of a brit, an alliance with God, is absolutely not identical to the idea of God as the king giving orders. Right? It's the, the, the idea of a covenant is very often, in fact, in scripture, uh, it, it's uh, often uh, compared to uh, the covenant between a husband and wife. Right? There, there can be a covenant between a husband and wife, that's called a brit. There can be a covenant between uh, a great king and a, and a small king, a local king, uh, the head of a city or a community. Both of these covenants assume not a distant, impersonal, perfect God who knows everything, who can just give orders, but just the opposite. They assume that the nature, the fabric of the reality that we live in is one in which God actually needs us. Anyone enters into a covenant, it's because he needs the person he's covenanting with. Now, a, a husband, he can, he, he can give all the orders that he wants to his wife. He can threaten her, he can be mean to her, he can, he can think that he can, he can tell her what to do. But when the prophets bring the image of God as the husband and Israel as the wife, they're saying exactly the opposite. They're saying, you can command all you want, but Israel, like the young wife, she'll make her own decisions. She'll go be with other men if she wants to. You can't force her to love you. You can't force her to obey you. You can be violent, but you can't make her do anything. Ultimately, the relationship between a man and a woman depends on the woman wanting to take part in the relationship. And the same is true of the relationship between God and man in scripture, in this other metaphor, which is so common. The metaphor of the covenant is a metaphor in which God realizes, he comes in the, in the stories that we see in the Bible, he comes to recognize that giving orders simply doesn't perfect the world. Human beings are free. They'll make all sorts of decisions. They'll make any decisions they want. If he wants the world to be repaired, if he wants it to be improved and fixed, then he needs our partnership. <coughs> Abraham is his partner. Israel is his partner. And God offers partnership to all of the nations of the world. That's a completely different understanding of our role in our relationship to, to God. And it, it allows us, for example, to argue with God, but it also means that we don't have to see God as giving orders. We can see God as, as looking for our partnership. 
and that's something that I think that, that Hebrew scripture is actually unique in offering the Western tradition. Well, Daniel, I, I would make uh, three points that are fundamental. Number one, it's absolutely clear that God loves people who argue with him. That's probably the most important reason he chose the Jewish people. <laughs> he just loves it. You know, Noah obeys, and God never really starts a major order with Noah, although he makes a very important covenant. But God loves Abraham and Moses and Jeremiah because they argue with him. To be a Jew, you know, other people have conversations. Jews only have arguments. Uh, the second principle, which is far from obvious, and when I first discovered it, it hit me like a bolt from the blue, is this. The Torah, the Pentateuch, contains a lot of commandments. 613, according to our traditional way of counting them. Now, you would have thought it is inevitable that a book that contains 613 commandments has somewhere within it a word that means to obey. Biblical Hebrew contains not one <laughs> single word that means to obey. And when Hebrew was revived in the 19th century as a spoken language, as it is in Israel today, they had to borrow a word from Aramaic, lutzayet, which doesn't exist in the Hebrew Bible. It's an Aramaic word, but that is the word used for to obey. What word does the Bible use instead of to obey? It uses the word shema, the first word of our holiest prayer, which means to listen, to hear, to understand. In other words, command and control is not at all the way God is in the Bible. He is speaking to our understanding, inviting us to become, in that lovely phrase of the rabbis, his partners in the work of creation. That's the second point. And the third point, which I just love, is this. God is father of humanity. You know, to my mind, when we talk about the Exodus, you know, the hero is Moses. But as I wrote in my Haggadah, actually the real heroes are six women. Uh, Miriam, Yocheved, uh, uh, Moses' mother, Shifra and Pua, uh, the two midwives, uh, Tzipporah, who is Moses' wife, who saves his life, and Pharaoh's daughter. Now, at least two and possibly four of those are not even Jewish. We don't know about Shifra and Pua. Were they Jewish? Were they not? Above and El thought not. So did Lutzata. Never mind. These are the moral heroines. And the heroine of all heroines is Pharaoh's daughter. She is the one who gives Moses his name. She is the one who rescues him from the river. She is the one who, at great risk to herself, adopts him and brings him up. After all, it was his fa her father who issued the decree every male Israelite child, Hebrew child, a kill, throw into the river. So at great risk, she is the one without whom there would be no Moses. She is the one who gave Moses his name. Now, the question is, what was the name of Pharaoh's daughter? And, they, and the book of Exodus does not tell us. But the book of Chronicles mentions a Pharaoh's daughter. Uh, and her name is Batya or Bitya. And that means God's daughter. And the Midrash, the rabbi said about this the following thing, which I think is beautiful. He said to Pharaoh's daughter, you adopted Moses as your son, even though he wasn't your son. I am going to adopt you as my daughter, even though you're not my daughter. Now, this is Hitler's daughter. Are you with me? This is the enemy writ large, and she is the moral heroine of all heroines. And I think there, that lovely touch of God adopting her uh, is just so beautiful. God is the father of humanity. There are only two perfect individuals in the whole of the Hebrew Bible. One is called Noah, the other one is called Job. They are both non-Jews. No Jew ever uh, merited you know, it says about Noah that it was an ish tzaddik, a righteous man, 
perfect in his generations, he walked with God. No other individual in the whole of the Hebrew Bible is called Tzadik. Did you know that, Yoram? You thought Joseph was called a Tzadik. I, I, I did, but I, I could but, see the objection coming, so I stopped. He didn't. He didn't. You know, um, Hosea says, you sold the righteous for a pair of shoes, and tradition said that was the brothers selling Joseph as a slave, but Hosea never calls Joseph a, a righteous man. The only righteous man in the whole of the Hebrew Bible is not Jewish. So that, that is just one example of God as the father of all humanity, which is absolutely, to my mind, inescapably the message of the Bible and the prophets are constantly saying this. And that's why I hope it's a book for all humanity. Well, on that note, I think I'd like to throw the discussion open to you, the audience. Um, to hear your views and please though try and keep keep the question brief uh, and it would be very helpful if you'd like to identify yourselves uh, you're not obliged to but it would be interesting for us this is a distinguished audience hi my name is Yoram Moff I'm an MLS student Yoram um, you spoke about the relevance of the of the Old Testament to set to the secular world and you spoke about creating morality from how you didn't think that, that, that morality could be created from the ground up. Um, and what I was really thinking of was, was that may be true, but why should it be this book? Surely, if, if we're talking to a, a secular person or a non Jewish person, why should, why should they? Why do they believe that they should use the Torah as, a, as the ultimate text as opposed to the Dinah? Well, I, I've, I've never proposed that the Torah be used as the, the only text. Uh, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I think that uh, uh, Plato or Aristotle, to pick two examples of you know, non-Jewish texts that, that I, I respect greatly and that, that many others do as well, uh, have plenty to contribute to the discussion, and I'm sure that there are other texts from other places in the world that I might be less familiar with, but that doesn't mean that they can't contribute. I'm sure that they can contribute. Uh, I, I think that the, the problem we have is not so much a problem of saying, why should this text be instead of other texts? I think the problem that we have in the societies in which we live is closer to being one of, as, as, as Daniel asked before, of, of why should we use any texts? I mean, that, that really is, I, I think, the, the, the argument. Because, I, look, I, I'm sure that I can sit with, uh, uh, just, just as I can sit with, a, you know, with, with, with a, uh, uh, someone who's really a, a convinced Platonist, I'm sure that I could also sit with a, with, with, uh, with a Muslim who loves his sources and believes that his sources are, are the best sources for helping uh, 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 create a, a good life for his, his people and for the world. I'm sure that we could find things to agree about. I'm sure that we could find important, crucial things to disagree about. And both of those are important. But I think that the, the, the chasm that divides all people who believe that traditions can be the source of helping us uh, work our way through to dealing with, with understanding difficult issues like questions in morality, political thought, theology, the difference between those people and the people who are running around today in the name of science, actually writing best-selling books, saying, you don't need any of this. You can throw all of it out. In fact, it's all pernicious. And what you really need to do is, is, is what we really need to do is to advance neuroscience so that we can measure what, within people's brains, what makes people happy and what makes people unhappy, as though that actually is capable of contributing to, 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 to moral knowledge. Now, that's what the, the principal debate is about. And as a, look, I, I'm not an expert in the Quran, so I, I can't tell you much about it. I know quite a bit about the Hebrew Bible. And I can tell you that the Hebrew Bible is in public discourse as well as in learned academic discourse, is treated as a barbaric text. It's treated as a text that if you're a normal person and, and you take a look at it, then you're simply not going to be able to find what all the fuss was about. I think it's important that we find what all the fuss is about because I don't believe, I've, I mean, I, I know quite a bit about, about these, 
uh, uh, contemporary alternatives. And I, I, I don't understand how they can come to replace the biblical tradition. And when I say biblical tradition, I mean not simply the texts as we have them, but the texts as interpreted and adopted and understood over many, many generations by many wise people contributed to them. I don't see an alternative. So if there is one, you know, I'm happy to take a look at it, but I don't think we have any choice if, if we want a moral world. If I could I just add as a footnote to that, um, the point made by Neil Ferguson towards the end of his uh, big book called Civilization. It's a wonderful, wonderful quote from a member of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences were charged with the task of answering the following question. China was ahead of the West in virtually every field up to the 15th century. <coughs> Thereafter, the West zoomed ahead. And the Academy of Social Sciences was charged with finding what did the West have that we didn't have. And uh, the academician says, at first, we thought it was your guns. You had better weapons than we had. Then we did some more research and realized that it was your political system. You had democracy and we didn't. Then we surveyed it a bit more and we realized it was your economic system. You had the market economy, and we didn't. But for the last 20 years, we've known the simple answer, which lies behind all the other answers, namely, it was your religion. Now, by that, he means that Judeo-Christian heritage, which conferred on the West its perennial restlessness between the world that is and the world that ought to be, which set in motion all the creative developments of the last five centuries. Now, I think I call a member of the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences as an impartial witness. Hi, my name is Adam Boxer. I'm a chemistry student. Uh, I was wondering, uh, it seems that it does seem it's a fact that all pieces of literature are written at a certain time, a certain place, addressed to a certain audience, uh, and they have to be understood from within that context. Uh, so both to Yoram and the chief rabbi, when you're looking to try and glean an authentic philosophy from the Hebrew Bible, how, do we, how are we supposed to navigate the really tricky area of the context of the Hebrew Bible and you know, various opinions that go along with that question? Well, look, Everything you say is true, and even the much more exaggerated forms of this that have been offered by, by all sorts of philosophers are also true to a certain extent, but I think that they all exaggerate. I think that we can recognize freedom when we see it. And when, when, uh, when uh, Gideon, Gidon, when he stands up to the uh, to, 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 to his uh, 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 brother Israelites who come to him and say, we want you to be a king and we want your son to rule over us forever. And he says, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you, but God will rule over you. Those words, I think, can be recognized by anyone in any civilization, regardless of, of what their background is. I think they can read those words and say, oh my gosh, what I'm seeing is freedom. I'm seeing the, a, a, a man stand and say, I want to not be ruled by other people, by all of these, these dictators, uh, the chief rabbi called Pharaoh Hitler, by all these, 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 these little dictators and Hitlers that, su that surrounded them. They want to be free. Now there are all sorts of more, more difficult and more sophisticated ideas in the Hebrew Bible that, that we'd have to talk about a little bit more. But at least some of these ideas, I think anyone can simply look at them. And so when, when, t when, when someone like, like uh, let's say, Tom Paine <coughs> refers to Gideon, to, refers to this passage in his uh, uh, trying to stir up the colonies to, well, I guess that's, that's probably not a good thing to, to, to bring up here in London. <laughs> to, so we'll use a different example. In any case, example. what? Thank God, yes. 
Are you sure you've forgiven I, I enough to? I think we've forgiven the Americans. All right, so I'll, I'll, right now. I'll yeah. proceed, but oh, I'm. I, I, sense, 1776. I, 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 I may, I, I, I may be suffer for this a little bit later. <laughs> but seriously, the, the, the reference of Tom Paine, you know, he may have thought all sorts of crazy things that I wouldn't necessarily agree with, but he reads the Bible over that chasm of, of, of millennia, and he reads that sentence, and he sees freedom. I, I think anybody should be able to, to, to see that. It's simply human beings don't change enough over the course of the centuries and the millennia, so they can't recognize freedom when they see it. And there are actually many other such things um, to that I would just add the following. It is absolutely constitutive of Jewish belief that there is an oral Torah together with the written Torah. That is, along with the Torah given at Sinai, is the ongoing work of interpretation and reinterpretation, which has never ceased. Um, the um, actual construction of that canon of 39 books which constitute the Hebrew Bible take a thousand years in real time from the days of Moses to the days of the last of the prophets. So there is a thousand year commentary on that mosaic core. You then get the canonization of the Hebrew Bible and from the third century BCE to the seventh century CE, you get a thousand years of commentary on the commentary called Midrash, Mishnah, and Gemara. That is, then reaches closure and you then get a thousand years of commentary on the commentary on the commentary and right now we're at the fourth level of commentary on the commentary on the commentary of the commentary and it never ceases. And because of that, uh, the word of God for all time becomes the word of God for this time. Without that constant commentary and reinterpretation, of which Yoram's book is a wonderful example, we can't hear the word of the Bible for this time. Oh my goodness, uh, now everyone wants to speak. Yes, the lady at the back, please. Um. Hi, I'm Mary Fortenbell, um, lecturer in modern this last question relates to something that the Chief Rabbi said earlier about how Judaism provides a means of granting humans dignity. And it raises an interesting question about when we look at the Torah, one of the, one of the uh, ideas we can note is the way in which the mute, for example, is put in a category. We're talking about the dignity that, that Judaism can find for the human, but there's, there's this sense in which the mute is, 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 is sidelined. sidelined. And interestingly, of course, the mute is sidelined along with another category, which is women. And when we talk about dignity, one of the other sort of key terms that can come up is, is this idea of board, the, the dignity of the congregation and community, and the idea that women fully participating in, in a worship service it impugns the, the dignity of the congregation. Now, this makes sense in a context, and we're talking about how changing contexts mean to change and adapt to different circumstances. So I'm wondering if, if both of you have something to, to say in, in terms of addressing that, that problem. Well, that I definitely give to Yoram. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very learned question. Uh, well, I'll do my best. Look, I, saying that, uh, that uh, Hebrew Bible or any other uh, significant source that you could point to, the Talmud or Plato or anything else, saying that it is foundational, or even going as far as saying it, that it's for us the foundation of our investigation into, uh, into uh, the truths of the moral and political world, is not the same as saying that absolutely everything that we consider to be right and correct today is already fully developed in, uh, in, in the Hebrew Bible. The Hebrew Bible is, a after all, something, as some, someone said, it, it was written at a certain time, and it was written for a certain time, although uh, I do believe that uh, the, those scriptures that have been handed down to us are those that have stood the test of time. And I think that uh, it's a mistake always to take such a text skip over the thousands of years of elaboration and development and say, oh, it's a perfect blueprint, or it was meant to be a perfect blueprint, or it could be used as a per It's not, it's not, it was not meant to be, and it isn't. However, I do think that 
the, um, the, the development uh, of the kind of consciousness that would allow you to ask such a question and to allow us to discuss it in in intelligently and to, to, to take sides on exactly how to apply it and what to do, I think that it's biblical. And I think that it is not Greek, and I don't know of any other source for it. Um, the, the, uh, the chief rabbi spoke about this astonishing uh, description of the way that the, 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 that the Jewish nation is born, the way that the Hebrew sla slaves are redeemed. They're redeemed by five women. Every one of those women, if she hadn't dared to break the law and do what she did, there would have been no Moses and there would have been no Israel and there would have been no hope for humanity. Right? And the, the Bible is built, it begins that way and it ends with uh, Esther, about whom I wrote, wrote a book. But let me just point w to one other example. All right, and I'm not saying that, that the Bible is not a patriarchal society, and I'm, I'm not denying any of that. Still, this example is worth paying attention to. When, when Moses is presenting the law, and the, the law to the nation, another five women stand up and say, you know, we believe that this law is unjust. This law is unfair. And the daughters of Tzlofchad, they demand that the law of God, given by the master of the universe and handed down by his prophet, be changed because they feel that it's unjust. Right? This is not something that you know, some modern commentator is coming up with. This is something that's right there in the, in, in the books of Moses. Somebody put it there. They demand that the law be changed, and Moses says, I'd better talk to God. He goes talk to God, and God says, the gals are right. We'd better change the law. Now, I propose to you that this is not a fully fleshed out uh, development as you might want to see of, of Judaism or morality as, as, as you'd like to have it. But on the other hand, the fact that it has to be there in our scriptures, that, that the question of the law can't be perfectly complete, even if it's from God and even it's f if it's from Moses, it can't be finally perfectly complete yet until these five women have their say and implying also sorts of others who may have been not quite heard or not quite taken into account. Well, that is a biblical message. And I think that by studying the Bible, we can come to that message. History is an arena of change. And obviously one of the fundamental questions is, um, does the Bible have a way of telling us what change is changing the right direction and what change is a way of getting lost? And um, as a result, you have to read the Bible very, very closely. And uh, one of the reasons that I think Yoram is absolutely right in seeing the Bible as a philosophical work is that that philosophy is overwhelmingly focused on the opening chapters of Genesis, which we've just begun to read in the synagogue. We just read the first chapters yesterday in the synagogue. And it's a little like Beethoven does at the beginning of the Grosse Fuga. You know, he sets out the themes, and then the development takes a long time, but at least those themes are set out. And here is a narrative that I want to share with you from Genesis chapters 2 and 3, which I haven't seen set out elsewhere. And it's quite important. Um, in Genesis 1, man and woman are created simultaneously, equally, in the image of God. In Genesis 2, they're created sequentially. And when Adam sees his wife for the first time, he utters the first poem in the Bible. It is actually what is called a chiasmus, A-B-C-C-B-A -C -C -A in Hebrew. She shall be called woman because she is taken from man. And that sounds quite nice, love at first sight. But actually, it's um, less than ideal. Why? Number one, he has not given her a proper name. He has given her a generic name. She's woman. And number two, she is subordinate to man. She was taken from man. You know, and Augustine did some stuff with that, partly influenced by Aristotle. I don't want to go down that line. Um, he saw a woman, you know, God, man is in the image of God and woman is in the image of man. You don't want to know this stuff. It's horrendous. Um, 
So, and, and as a result of which, bad things happen. The woman rebels, eats the forbidden fruit, persuades her husband, her husband eats it. God says, Adam, what have you done? And what does he do? He blames his wife. <laughs> I hope we've changed a little bit since then, but I'm not always sure. He said, look, if you'd never created this woman, would I have eaten the apple? And it is then that something happens. There's this strange sequence of verses. Adam turns to his wife and gives her a new name. He calls her Chava, Eve, which is a proper name. And he then attributes to her something that makes her greater than he is. He haita em kol chai. She is the mother of all life. If we want to be eternal, because we're not going along and going to be, live forever, so we will only achieve immortality through our children, and I cannot give birth to those children, only she can. And at that moment, Adam has done two things. He's valued her as an individual, and he has set her value above himself. And the very next verse says, and God made them garments of big day could not or garments of skin. However, in the school of Rabbi Ishmael, Rabbi Ishmael lived up in the Galil, and in the Galil they didn't make a difference between an olive and an iron, which are both gutturals. And he read it could not or God made them garments of light. In other words, this couple that he had expelled from Eden, nonetheless, the second Adam recognizes his, woman, his wife is a person, not just woman, and not just subsidiary to himself, but greater than himself. God clothed them both in light. And I now want to show you something else that the biblical critics never understood. They're completely tone deaf to the two names of God in the Bible. What, what in the biblical critical language they call J and E, uh, Hashem and Elohim. If you look at Genesis 1, it's entirely written as E. As in Genesis 2 and 3, it's J-E. And Genesis 4, it's J. Right? Now, what is the difference between E and J? The, the biggest, greatest answer ever given to that was Judah Halevi in the fourth book of the, his philosophical masterpiece called the Kuzari, in which he says, E is the God of Abraham, uh, E is the God of Aristotle, the God of creation who deals in generalities, universal laws, and J is the God of Abraham, the individual who relates to individuals. You see how the Bible is telling us that it is only when Adam recognizes his wife as a person that he is capable of recognizing God as a person. So if we men are deficient in our respect for women, we will to that degree be deficient in our religious sense of God himself. So we see that the Bible is setting out an ideal right at the beginning so that the more we honor women, the closer we are getting to that biblical ideal. And now I want to put a bit more flesh on that. And I'm going to do so in the name of a former Sephardi chief rabbi of Israel called Rabbi Bakshi Doron, who was Sephardi chief rabbi Rishon LeZion in the 1980s or 1990s? 1980s. What? 1990s. Bakshi Doron makes a very interesting contrast between what Max Weber calls charismatic authority and bureaucratic authority. Who is the charismatic authority in the Bible? The prophet. Who is the bureaucratic authority in the Bible? The priest. Women can't be priests, but they can certainly be prophets. There were seven women biblical prophets. So when it comes to that individual dignity, Jewish law never distinguished between men and women, the world of the prophet. But when it came to kavod hatzibur, the whole field of sociology, which deals with our shortcomings, because <coughs> Blokes create things, you may have noticed this, called alpha males. Uh, in fact, <laughs> a lot of Jewish politics is best studied through uh, the, uh, the interactions of alpha males uh, at, at various levels of the animal kingdom. So, uh, and, you know, so alpha males need kavod, they need honor, and hence the social position of women. 
in Judaism has never been as egalitarian as the charismatic position of women as prophetesses, judges like Deborah, teachers of Torah like the late Nechama Leibovitz and Lahavdil, uh, uh, you know, Viva Zornberg and so on and so forth. So there is an arena in which the women, dignity of women has always been equal to men in Judaism. But once that gets into the fields of sociology, it has not always been equal. And we can say that the 20th century and so far the 21st have seen the biggest advances in the role of women within the Jewish religious world, uh, the greatest advances that have ever taken place. Have we reached the destination? Not yet. Uh, are, is the Jewish people ready for that? Not yet. But at least there's been major progress. Down here at the front, please. Um, my name is Miriam Rosenbaum. I guess my most important identity here is your own daughter is Rumi. Um, anyway, um, my question to you is, you both spoke a lot about God-loving argument, and I'm wondering if you can at all distinguish that from rebellion. Um, and added to that, because we know that there are many examples of God punishing rebellion, um, and added to that, do you think there's a difference between an individual who argues with God um, which can separate himself from the community versus the Jewish people as a whole argument with God. Um, my, my book deals quite a bit with, uh, with uh, uh, the issue of disobedience. Uh, and the, the reason that I, that I dwell on it is uh, principally to attempt some kind of corrective because there are so many people who think, who actually say, the Bible is a book of obedience. Uh, Prof Professor uh, uh, John Levinson from Harvard just pu published a critique of the book in which he re-emphasizes the, the Bible is a book of love, service, and obedience. Now there's plenty of love, service, and obedience that's good in the Bible. There must be a thousand times where we're, 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 we're told that we should follow or keep uh, the laws. And e e even taking uh, the chief rabbi's correct understanding of the Hebrew into account, that's an awful lot of times of telling us that we should be forming our lives according to the laws as we understand them. So I'm not saying that the book is not at all a Bible of obedience and people are completely wrong if they, if they say that. But there's much else that, that, that's in the Bible. There's, 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 uh, there's anger and there's audacity and there's disobedience. And um, uh, much of the time, we're surprised to discover that God loves those people who are in fact not, not obeying. I mean, the, 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 the shocking fight between God and, uh, and Moses after the sin of the golden calf in which God says, I'm going to destroy this people for what it's done, which seems pretty, you know, pr pretty reasonable in context. Uh, given, given that they just received the commandments yesterday and already they've, they've created uh, another God for themselves. And, 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 and Moses says, absolutely not. You can't do that because if you do that, then you've violated your promise and then, then, then there's no order in, 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 in this world. God can't simply promise to save this people and take them to the land of Israel and then decide to change his mind. And there's a fight that goes on for five pages where they threaten one another. They threaten one another. There's a sit-down strike. Moses refuses. He says, if you're not, going to, you're not going to take this people up, then write me out of your book. And God gives him direct orders and says, you go up. You go up now, twice. Those are direct commands. And Moses refuses, and he won't do it. Now, you're absolutely right that there are plenty of places where, 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 where somebody you know, disobeys something and gets zapped. And, 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 and you know, the, the, the ground opens up and, and everybody gets swallowed because they disobeyed something. But I think that in order to understand this, it's not a matter of, you know, it's just all sorts of different stories and it's arbitrary. I think it's actually quite not arbitrary. I think the point is that the God of Israel is looking for people who are actually able to help understand what the good and the just way is. And when God looks at someone like Moses or Abraham or Jacob or Abel, Right? and sees, why well, this, is, this, is, this is someone who's made an effort and has actually come up with something that I didn't think of for how we can achieve justice. You'll notice that, that I didn't think of, we won't have time to talk about it now, we'll have to talk about it some other time. But the God of Israel in Hebrew Bible is not 
unchanging and all-knowing in advance. He's, he's simply not in these stories. What to make of it is a different question, but in the biblical stories, he's not that. That comes to us from Greek philosophy, from Greek theology. The God of Israel looks at someone like uh, Abel, who rebels against the, the, the instruction to, to, to serve the soil and become a farmer, and he says, I see that this creature, this person, this man is, or this woman is, is struggling not just to resist and not just out of a desire for good, but has actually achieved an insight that brings the world towards something that's better that I, God, hadn't thought of before. And I, I think, by the way, that the daughters of Tzlofchad, that, that that story should also be seen in that light. If you're going to take the risk of wrestling with God and rebelling against God and fighting with God, well, you'd better be right, because if you're not right, then, then the results might not be so good. But the, the Bible consistently holds out this very strange and decisively important possibility, which again descends to us from Hebrew scripture and not from other sources that, that I'm familiar with, which is that a human being can take the risk, risk God's wrath, rebel, resist, even refuse, and if he or she has succeeded in identifying something that God then recognizes something is better, then that receives honor and respect and love above anything else. Do you want to add to that? <clears throat> I think if there is uh, one Greek philosopher, I mean, Jews admire, an awful lot of Greek philosophers, but if there's one we really love and half wish had been Jewish is Socrates, because he's always arguing and always asking difficult questions. And I find the fascinating, the contrast between Socrates and, and Pesach, Passover, because the citizens of Athens condemned Socrates to death for corrupting the young. And what did he do? He taught them to ask questions, whereas in on Pesach, the thing that every parent has to do is teach your child to ask questions. And the lowest of the low is the Sheino Yudeli Shol, the child who doesn't know how to ask. You've got a good, wise son, a wicked one, a simple one, but the lowest of the low is the one who can't ask questions. So the question is, what's a good question and what's a bad question? And it's very interesting. We have the wise son's question, which is as follows. This is from Deuteronomy chapter, wherever it is, chapter 6. It shall, when your son asks you in future, what mean all these laws, statutes, and justice, uh, judgments that God has commanded you? And what does the wicked son ask? When your child says to you, what does all this mean to you? Now, there are many ways of distinguishing between these two. The Haggadah has one, the Jerusalem Talmud has another. However, some of our commentators make, to my mind, the finest distinction of all. Namely, look at the verb in the two sentences. The wise son asks, the wicked one says. In other words, the wicked one doesn't really want an answer to the question. He's only questioning for the sake of putting down, ridiculing, and walking away. And that, I think, is the key distinction. If somebody asks, challenges, argues, but are willing to listen, they really want an answer to the question, they are willing to engage in what I had with Bernard Williams, the collaborative pursuit of truth, then you are part of the conversation, and we embrace you. Okay, you know, you don't keep everything, but you're part of that continuing conversation, which is the human embodiment of what I call the oral Torah, Judaism's conversation with God through the text of the Hebrew Bible. But if all you want to do is put down challenge and, and ridicule and then walk away, then I'm afraid that's not part of the conversation. And I think that is why, you know, I, I went into the lion's den to see whether, you know, some of the world's great atheists today are willing to engage in that conversation. And I think the truth is that um, that is ultimately 
your, um, you know, the, the, the bottom line of your thing. Why is the Hebrew Bible important? Because in Judaism, the holiest thing of all is words. It's certainly not power. It's certainly not numbers. It's certainly not might or force. And it's not even obedience. It's God speaks and wants us to hear, to listen, to understand, and to respond. And that sacred conversation, which is our continuing commentary on a text that will never be obsolete so long as human beings still walk the face of this earth and still aspire to hope, let us be part of that sacred conversation. Thank you. Well, uh, it's very beautiful. Just to conclude, everybody, um, I just thought I would quote um, a great Jewish writer who, however, was not in every way a good Jew. Um, I'm thinking of Saul Bellow, the novelist. Uh, Bellow changed his name from, uh, he was brought up orthodox, but he changed his name from Solomon to Saul because he thought it, Saul was somehow more, more American, more acceptable to non-Jewish society. Uh, and uh, he, he struggled all his life uh, with his, his Jewish identity. But in his great novel, Mr. Zamler's Planet, at the end of the, of the novel, Mr. Zamler is a bit like Bellow himself. He's not a very religious man in the conventional way. Uh, but he is a Holocaust survivor. He's experienced terrible things. And he speaks at the end about God. Uh, he can't quite come to terms with, with God, but he knows also that he can't do without God, and he can't do without the God of Israel. And he comes up with one sentence which, it seemed to me, really resonates in what we've been talking about this afternoon. He says, the inability to explain is no ground for disbelief. Just because you can't understand the terrible things in the world just because you can't understand why God wants us to do certain things, to be certain, to live our lives in a certain way, that doesn't mean you should not believe in him. And I think we've heard today two remarkable thinkers, remarkable writers, uh, talk about why God's words to us in the Bible are still as indispensable as they ever were. Uh, and they're indispensable regardless of where we come from, what tradition we belong to, and what we believe. So I'd be grateful if you could all show your appreciation in the traditional way. Thank you very much.